Matthew chapter 16, verse 1. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. So here, both the Pharisees and the Sadducees were coming to try to test Jesus. We're trying to catch him out. They were doing damage control. The people were following after Jesus, and they were turning away from the Pharisees. And so they were losing control of the people, and they didn't like that. They wanted the power. They wanted the control. And they also profited a lot off the people. And so here Jesus was winning favor with the people. The people were starting to follow him and they were losing their control of them. And so they didn't like that. Even though Jesus was this extraordinary man doing amazing miracles, they should have been happy about that. But they didn't care. They actually didn't care about people getting healed, getting fed, getting delivered. They just cared about people because they wanted to control them and to have power. And Jesus, he continually exposed their hypocrisy and help to open the eyes of Israel to see through the Pharisees and to see through religion and external religion that cannot save you. It's what happens in the heart and you have to have faith in the heart in order to be saved and enter into the kingdom. And so here the Pharisees in damage control come to try to test Jesus and to catch him out because they're looking for a way to arrest him and get rid of him. And so they asked him to show them a sign. Give us a sign from heaven. In other words, you're not the Messiah. If you were, you would show us a sign from heaven. And it's ridiculous because Jesus, everywhere he went, he was doing miracles, driving out demons, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, healing the cripples, opening blind eyes, like phenomenal miracles. Those things showed forth his glory. They were proofs and confirmations that he was the son of God, the Messiah, the anointed one. No one in all of Israel had ever done the things that Jesus did. And all of a sudden someone shows up on the scene doing these mighty miracles and they have the audacity to say, show us a sign. It's, it just shows their hardness of heart, their stubbornness and their unbelief. They don't want a sign because he knows they don't want to believe. They've had all these other signs and they don't believe. And now they're saying, we want a sign. It's just... It's just a trap. Verse 2, he answered them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the time. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them. And departed. So he says, you guys, you know how to interpret the skies, but you don't know how to interpret the times. In other words, the scriptures all point towards the Messiah coming at this time. This is the very time when they knew Messiah would be here. The prophecy of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7, which all of them would have been very familiar with, that prophecy predicts the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, around this very time. So they would have known that the Messiah would have been here at that time. And here is Jesus doing these mighty miracles, showing all of these signs, claiming to be the Messiah. And yet they reject him. And basically Jesus is saying, you should accept me and you should have received me as, as Messiah. And the fact that you don't and you're still asking for a sign shows that you are an evil and adulterous generation. Adulterous meaning that they're no longer faithful to God. They're no longer following God. They've run off to other religions, to other gods, to other faiths. They don't have faith in God. If they did, they would have received Jesus. The fact that they didn't proved that they were evil and adulterous. And Jesus just says, no, no sign's going to be given except for the sign of Jonah, which was Jonah was in the belly of the, the fish for three days and for three nights. And that's the sign that, that, that Jesus, the son of God, will be in the, the belly of the earth after his crucifixion for three days and for three nights. And then he will rise up as a proof that he was the Messiah. And in him, the Gentiles will hope. And it's like Jonah came out of the belly and he went and preached to Nineveh. And Nineveh, the Gentile nations, repented at the preaching of Jonah. And he's saying, but you Pharisees, you don't repent at my preaching. And previously in other chapters, he said, one greater than Jonah is here. And before he said, Nineveh will rise up and condemn this generation because even Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. But you 
are not repenting at my preaching. And I am greater than Jonah. I am the Messiah, the Son of God. And you should have repented. And so again, Jesus, he's just drawing attention to these Pharisees and their stubbornness of heart. And they're so bound by their religion. And I just love that Jesus calls them out on their hypocrisy, on their evil hearts, their stubbornness. And, and the whole generation of Israel that were rejecting Christ, they should have accepted him. They should have known the times. They should have known what was happening. They had no excuse. But, they had, but the reason that they didn't accept him is because of their evil and adulterous hearts. And I just love the fact that he's not afraid to challenge them, to rebuke them publicly. And then he just leaves. Verse 5, when the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch out and beware for the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. <laughs> they thought he was talking about bread again. But Jesus, he was talking about something else. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O oh, you of little faith. Wow. Jesus said this to them quite a lot, didn't he? Why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? It's like they, they're still so slow. They're almost getting it, but they can't quite get it. Jesus is just patient with them. He's like, you guys have got little faith. You're just not quite understanding. And they must have been frustrated within themselves. It's like, man, why can't we just understand what he's saying? It's because their mindsets were still so set in the old ways. And he had to break them out of that thinking. And that was the whole thing about repentance. It was changing the way you think. And Jesus came to bring repentance to Israel to change their thinking from the old way of works and external religion into faith and the change of a heart in order to enter into the kingdom. How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Ah. He's not talking about bread. He's talking about the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And that's what Jesus was saying. He's saying, beware of it. And up until this point, Israel had been following the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Their minds were trained in their teaching. And Jesus was saying, beware of their teaching. It is corrupt. It is false. It's the blind leading the blind. It's destructive teaching because it's actually not saving anyone, but it's leading people towards destruction. It's leading people towards a self-deception that you can save yourself by all these external things that you do when that is not the truth. The only way you can be saved is by believing in Jesus and receiving the Messiah. Verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. That's amazing. So he asked them, who do people say that I am? And people were saying, oh, Jeremiah, Elijah, another prophet. And he's like, who do you say I am? I just love the fact Simon Peter, the guy that got out of the boat to walk on water. He just steps out and goes, I'm going to have a crack at it. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this was a divine revelation. That revelation came from God. Because the truth was, Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, the promised one. And Peter, by revelation, he understood that. Most of Israel struggled to understand it. But Peter, he had a revelation and he understood it. And Jesus changed Simon's name from Simon to Peter. 
Simon means a little pebble, but Peter means a rock. Jesus was saying, Simon, you're not some little pebble. You, you're struggling to understand and you're trying. And, but you know what? I'm, I've got my eyes on you. I'm training you. I'm discipling you. You're not some little pebble. You're a mighty rock. And I'm going to use you mightily. And this revelation that you've had, that I am the Christ, this is what I'm going to build my church on. Now, Jesus wasn't saying that, Peter, you're going to be a pope, the first pope of the church, and I'm going to build the church on you. No, he's not building the church on Peter. He's building the church on the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah. And my church, because it is built on Christ, it is powerful because Christ is the king of the kingdom. And God's kingdom is greater than the kingdom of darkness. And the gates of hell, the authority of hell, the power of hell, are not going to prevail over the church that is foundationed on Christ, on the revelation of Christ and on the King of Kings. And that is a wonderful promise. He's saying the gates of hell are not so powerful. He's saying the kingdom is far more powerful. Because then he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And that is speaking about authority. The, 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 the power to bind demons and to lock up things and to unlock things. So there's a power to set the captives free, to unlock prison doors and, and people that are demonized, to unlock the chains, to take the chains off them by the power of Jesus, by the authority of Jesus and to bind up things. It's, it's to bind up the enemy's influence. And he doesn't just get to come and operate and do whatever he wants. But you are children of the kingdom and you have authority. And he says, I'll give you the keys. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. That means you have authority that comes from the king and it comes from a revelation that Jesus is the Christ and a church that is built on that revelation is a strong church, is a rock, is a powerful church. And it's a church that operates in the authority of the kingdom and of the king. It has been given authority by Jesus, the keys. The devil doesn't have the keys. Jesus took the keys away from the devil and he's giving keys and his authority to the church that has a revelation of Christ. And it will be a powerful church that can bind up the influence of the demonic realm over people's lives. And it can loosen and set people free because of the authority. And where the enemy has, has bound people up, you can come in the authority of Christ and loosen the captives and loosen the chains and set people free. And this is what you see Jesus doing in his ministry. He walks around binding up the demonic realm and loosening chains of people's lives and setting the captives free. And then he told his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. And this is interesting because he wanted people to believe that he was the Christ. But perhaps he didn't want people just to have a secondhand revelation that he was the Christ. He wanted people to have their own revelation. Like Peter, he had a revelation. God revealed it to him that Jesus was the Christ. And so Jesus is like, don't go and tell everyone. Let them have their own revelation that I am the Christ. Let them see the signs and the wonders and the miracles. Let them hear the wisdom that's coming through me. And let them have their own divine revelation that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And that's incredible. Like just before, it was revealed to him from heaven that Jesus is the Son of God. And he had this divine revelation revealed from him. And now he's gone back to operating in natural knowledge and not faith and not seeing and not revelation because he still doesn't fully understand that Jesus has to suffer and die for people's sins so that people can be forgiven and receive eternal life. He's still of the thinking that Jesus is coming as a mighty king. And so he sees Jesus doing all these mighty works multiplying food, walking on water, raising the dead, rebuking the Pharisees. He sees Jesus doing all these mighty works and speaking with such wisdom. He, he's had revelation that he's the king. And in his thinking, 
He thinks that Jesus is going to keep rising up in authority and eventually take over Israel and kick out the foreign occupants, kick out Rome, and, and reclaim the kingdom of Israel. In Peter's thinking, that's what's going to happen. But he doesn't realize that what needs to happen is Jesus needs to die for the sins of the world because he's the Lamb of God. He was born to die. He came to die. He came to suffer on behalf of humanity and take the wrath of God on himself and be punished in our place so that we could be forgiven and set free from our sins, receive the gift of righteousness and the gift of eternal life, be born again and enter into the kingdom. Peter still didn't quite understand that. And so he was going to be Jesus' savior. No, Jesus, you're not going to do that. You're not going to die. Don't say it. Don't be negative. Don't say such terrible things. Still didn't get it. And then Jesus just comes out with this incredible rebuke. Get behind me, Satan. It's like, wow, before you were so nice to Peter. You were calling him a rock. You know, this is incredible revelation he's had. Now you're saying you're from the devil. It's like, Jesus is awesome. He, he just, he doesn't pander to us. He, he doesn't care about our, our feelings and offending us. Because sometimes we need to be offended. Because sometimes we're blind. We can't see things clearly. We're stuck in our old ways. We have mindsets that are, we have strongholds in our mind that are stopping us from receiving the truth and walking in the will of God. And so sometimes Jesus has to really shatter those mindsets and with a stern word, with a rebuke. And he wasn't trying to hurt Peter. He was loving Peter. And through that word, it was to open Peter's eyes and to snap him out of it and help him to see what the truth was. And so sometimes we do this with people. We might rebuke them. We might give them a stern word. It's never ever to hurt them. It's always redemptive to help open their eyes. And Jesus, it says he spoke the truth in love. And we need to have both. We, we can be like him and speak the truth to people, but speak it in love. And if you've got truth with no love, it can just be harsh and hurt people and do damage. And people may not even receive it because it's coming without love and it's too much for them to be able to handle. But if you just have love, without the truth, then that's not actually going to help people because they need the truth. But in order to help them receive it and to hear it, it needs to come with love. Because it's not about speaking the truth and winning an argument and just being right. It's about speaking the truth to people because you love them and you want to see their lives change and you want to see them receive Jesus and walk in his fullness. In verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So Jesus is telling his disciples and telling people what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That we don't just try to add Jesus to our selfish life. We think, oh yeah, we like that he feeds us, he heals us. And so we'll just add him to our life. No, he was saying, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, if you want to believe Jesus and receive him and be saved, you need to give up your life. You need to surrender to Christ. You need to pick up your cross and die. And, and actually, in order to be born again, you have to die. And Galatians 2.20 says, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And Jesus said, Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it can bear no fruit. And so we're like that seed. And so in order to be born again and be a true follower of Christ, you first have to die. And that's crucified with Christ. And that's giving up your life. And he's saying, if you try to hold on to your life, you're going to lose everything. It's like whatever you had, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life, then you will gain life. And I love what famous missionary once said. He said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And so giving, your, giving up your life to Jesus is not a foolish thing. It's the greatest thing that you can do. I don't want to hold on to my life. God is the one who gave me life. He created my life. And I don't want to just live for myself and do my thing and do my will. No, I, I, I fall at the feet of Jesus. I fall at the cross. I pick up my cross. I say, it's not my will. It's not my life. I, I surrender to Christ. I die to myself 
to my old life. Jesus, come alive in me. Make me alive. And uh, that's, that's what needs to happen for anyone to follow Christ. We're not, it's not a half-hearted thing. It's not adding Jesus to your life. It's giving up your life and dying and surrendering to him so that he can come alive in you. He becomes the Lord of our life. It's no longer our will. It's his will. It's no longer we're following after our own life, but we're following after Christ. And Jesus is saying this in the context that one day at the end of the age, the angels are going to come and they're going to harvest this earth and everyone is going to stand before God and give an account for their life. And those that have given up their life to Christ, they've received Christ, believed in him, they are going to receive life, eternal life, and enter into the kingdom. Those that rejected Christ and held on to their own life and followed their own ways, they're going to lose everything and be cast into outer darkness. And then he says, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He's talking about his death and his resurrection is very imminent. It's, it's about to happen. It's coming very soon. And that there's people here that are not going to die without seeing that happen. And they will see him again. After he rose, he appeared to many people and he walked among people showing himself to many for 40 days after his resurrection. And that was his resurrected body. And so people saw him after he had come into his kingdom. What he's saying is that it's very imminent. It's going to happen soon. And, and this is the fulfillment of what has been prophesied for so long. This is the kingdom of God is at hand. And as Jesus dies and he rises again and he ascends and he sits down, all of a sudden it's been made possible for people to enter into the kingdom.